think it'd be too much to call her a top Bigfoot expert? Uh, we're live now, by the way. Smitty. Okay. <laughs> he missed be that. Live. Which <laughs> means she could just go back and listen to that awkward comment. Yes. Yes, she is definitely that. She's known the world over for her Bigfoot expertise. Well, that's what I thought. I mean, she's pretty big in the Bigfoot circles. I guess was that a Bigfoot joke. Uh, no, that wasn't a Bigfoot joke. That was just kind of a conundrum, I guess. I don't know exactly what it was, but hey, guess what? This is all things unexplained. My, I had teach a class. It's called Scott. Well, it's actually called Local Cultures, but it's Scholars Bowl class. And they get to make a presentation every week. And this week, their presentation was on cryptozoology, cryptozoology. So uh, they all picked a cryptid and they cryptid this week. I hope that was an automatic Spotify. A. <laughs> it was. It was an automatic A. One did Nessie. One had a presentation on Nessie. Chupacabra. Uh, of course, the Yeti. Uh, one I've never... A couple of them I've never heard of. Uh, some, Becky, uh, some kind of sea monster. For those joining us, we're just in the pre-show here. And I need to find something. There it is. So CJ and Smitty, while I'm working on this, we we are live. We haven't officially started yet, though. But one did the Mothman, which is up kind of around your area. It's in West What's Virginia. What's the Mothman? Supposed to be this bird like, man like creature. It's like full size. And supposed to swoop down from the sky. It was a movie with about it with Richard Gere and uh, the redheaded woman that played Deborah. Is it Messing? Yeah. It's been a while yeah, since it came out in like 2000. Huh? It's been a while since I've seen it. The Mothman. Yeah, I haven't saw you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it was based off a book in 1960 something. Yeah, I but, read the uh, book long before I saw the movie. It should be no surprise, the movie is not nearly as good as the book. Yeah, they never usually are, so that's not much of a surprise. So, Smitty, what's the um, gas situation like in Mississippi? Oh, some people are panicking. I'm not really too worried about it personally, but we've said so. Several people have had pictures of people with like five gallon, I mean five, uh, five gas tanks or gas cans filling them all up. And did you see the one with the lady from 2019 where she was putting gas in a grocery sack, the plastic oh grocery sack, and she no. was double bagging. Yeah, which gas would eat through the plastic like that, but oh. know, I'm surprised. I'm sure her trunk of her car was just filled with gas. That it was, was in Mississippi? Pretty insane. No, it wasn't in Mississippi. I don't know where it was at. But that was in 2019, but everybody's going crazy about, some are about getting gas. Our gas prices only raise like 10 cents a gallon, so I'm not too concerned with it. I heard on that story today they like uh paid the people who did that four million dollars to reverse it. The hackers what? Paid they them actually off. paid people? No way. That's what no. one of my the guy at work told me and he like keeps up with the news religiously. I challenge I'm to look it up. an actual link to that news. Yeah, I just don't believe that. It's because that is erroneous. What was the name of the what was the name of the pipeline? Colonial. Colonial. 
Becky Cook says she's uh, attempting to connect. If I remember our last guest on Facebook Live, Jeremy, no, Jonathan, sorry, Fink, author Jonathan Fink had some similar issues. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So we've just admitted author Becky Cook to our green room. Becky, you can hear us, but we cannot hear you yet. I'll bring you in after Smitty gives you an introduction. We're not quite ready for that introduction yet because I'm going to let Larry bring us into the show. So, Becky, I see you just hanging there for a few minutes, looking great over there with your headphones and ready to talk some Bigfoot action with us. CJ, you ready? I'm ready. Let's Smitty, roll. You ready? I'm ready. It's actually, real quickly, that's actually on CNN. Colonial Pipeline did pay ransom. I don't believe that. You can look it up. <laughs> You'll so, need at least two sources. All right, here's Larry. Oh, let's... All Things Unexplained. Hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. <laughs> CJ Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. Uh, I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. Good evening. I was waiting on CJ to jump in. That's usually her cue. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I did ask if Smitty was doing the whole intro. So, you know, there it goes. But hey, everybody, welcome to All Things Unexplained. That is how we roll. I guess we're going Smitty style tonight and just uh, free ball. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you're catching us on Facebook Live, happy to have you. We would love to get any of your questions or comments tonight. We have a very, very exciting evening ahead with our guest, and I will throw it over to Smitty to me. Yeah, we're very excited tonight on All Things Unexplained to have Becky Cook, a phenomenal writer and also a Bigfoot expert. She has lives in the gym state of Idaho. She has written several books about Bigfoot. One is Bigfoot Lives in Idaho. Uh, she's also written Bigfoot Lives Forever in Idaho, and she writes, has written Bigfoot Lives Everywhere, and Bigfoot Still Lives in Idaho, and we are so pleased to have her tonight. Here's Becky. Hi. Becky. Good to see you. Hey, hey Becky. Becky. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. <laughs> <laughs> We have a gym from the gym state with us tonight. Oh, that was the, sweet, Smitty. <laughs> G-E-M. The G-E-M guy, not the J-I-M. Uh, we're glad to have you. I did have to have Tim clarify that earlier, too, when he said gem. You guys certainly have a different way of saying gem. <laughs> yeah. Usually it sounds like the name. When we say gym here in the South, it all sounds the same. It's. J I M sounds like G E M. So <laughs> that's our, that's our accent. But it's good to have you tonight. We're so yeah, we're so, so pleased to have us. you on the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I can honestly tell you, in preparation for this uh, chat with you tonight, I learned more about Idaho in the last 24 hours than I knew in my entire existence. And now I want to know why. Why have I not been to Idaho yet? I can't. I don't understand. But I'm ready to go. <laughs> it's a very beautiful state. You'd enjoy it. Yeah, oh, that's yes. on my list. Thirty-one states. I needed. I've got a few more. To, Nineteen left, and I, I want to get all of them before they put me in the ground one day. So. <laughs> well. One thing Becky, I you guys have had an influx of people in Idaho, haven't you? Hasn't there just been a ton of people flocking to live there recently? Yes. Yes. Just 
a bunch of people coming up from California and um, majority from California, some from Utah, some from Washington and Oregon, that area. Oh yeah, CJ escaped California to move to North Carolina. I did, <laughs> but my parents were thinking about moving to Idaho and they went there to visit and everybody was like, oh, you Californians driving up all of our prices in town. <laughs> it's it's true. A lot of the prices yeah. are really going crazy. <laughs> oh, I bet. I, bet. Yeah, you know, I kind of wonder how long they'll stick around, you know, when once we get the crazy, crazy snow. They're not they're not that bad most years, but there are definitely years where you're like, holy cow. <laughs> that would knock me out. I'd be gone. Bye. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the true test right there as a native Mississippian. I think Smitty and I would would not tolerate that winter too well. Yeah, we get a, like an inch of snow around here, and every loaf of bread and every gallon of milk is completely gone off the shelves, and we're pretty much snowbound if, with an inch of snow. So, Wow. Uh, I don't know why people want to make milk sandwiches, but apparently people just love bread and milk when it snows. I don't know what the deal is with that. Comfort food. It's, Comfort it's, food. I yeah. guess so. And toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, that was a coronavirus. Although how though, they but... eat toilet paper, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, that should be on my strong addiction. That show on on TV. So, <laughs> well, I tell you what. The one thing: the more I learned about Idaho, the more I could see this as being a really squatchy place. It it really was impressive. So the population of Idaho is only. One, roughly 1.8 million people right now, which yeah. just blew blew my mind. It's the 12th least populous state in the country, but the 13th largest state geographically. So you've got a lot of wide open space there, right? Yep. Yep. A lot of mountains, some really beautiful, beautiful country. One of my kids was saying, well, there's not really any national parks, but there are wilderness areas that are set aside for for future, I don't know, for future populations to enjoy. Oh, yeah. And that's something somebody online commented about that Idahoans, I hope, is that how you say it? Idahoans? <laughs> Idahoans. <laughs> Idahoans. Idahoans. Buttheads. No, I'm Hi. just kidding. You might want to leave the whole part out. You might want to leave the whole part out. But. I really have never used that term before. So, Idahoans, somebody said online, must not really like private land because there are four and a half million acres of wild land, uh, uh, public land with no roads. What's or sixty three percent of all, all of Idaho is public land, and I guess within that sixty three percent, four and a half million acres are wild land, which means no roads, no nothing, just untamed wilderness, and that was flabbergasted. I thought, and wow, Bigfoot. what a perfect setup for Bigfoot, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think that that has to do do with a lot of. The habitat has to do with a lot of the Bigfoot sightings there. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used, I used to hear more stories from out in the central part of the state where we thought of it as like the Devil's Triangle. It was just a triangular area where there was nothing. And I used to hear yeah. some really terrific stories there. And, and then lately, I haven't heard any. But, um, but further up north... Yeah, there's there's more as people come into contact with the Bigfoot than they have these amazing run-ins and they tell us about them. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, that's kind of weird you say that because there's a lot of people around here, I think, that that would but see Bigfoot more frequently, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the past. But now that population's grown, there's more houses, those types of things. Loss of habitat may lead to not as many sightings. Oh. Hmm. I don't know. I think some people just don't pay attention because oh, I've seen sure. Bigfoot right down in in um, uh, subdivisions 
You know, and I just figure people aren't paying attention. I don't know how the heck they got there. <laughs> that's one thing we have established on this show is that most people are not paying attention to anything, which is why everything is getting missed. And there's still a few people out there that are keeping their eyes open and keeping their heads up and taking note of what is in their surroundings see things and it seems especially in your books that that is a theme those that have seen bigfoot spend a lot of time outdoors yep. hunters and military men and people that like to camp and fish and things like that who are outdoors see bigfoot if you're indoors looking at your phone all the time you're not going to see it <laughs> it's not going to happen <laughs> yep. yep yep and you know <laughs> becky it's funny you should say that you saw Bigfoot in a subdivision, and we definitely want to hear more about your Bigfoot experiences. But one of the stories that struck me from your book I was reading, Bigfoot Still Lives in Idaho, was a short, a short story of Stuart Matthews, who I believe was in Pocatello. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm saying these names wrong. I no, that's perfect. Oh, great. Thank you. So I, I literally know, <laughs> essentially know Idaho, Idahoan geography. Except Boise, I suppose. But Pocatello, Stu uh, someone named Stuart Matthews is there. Mm -hmm. He's a former Special Forces Army, a currently a neuromuscular therapist. So we're talking about a really knowledgeable, um, dependable witness here, right? And mm -hmm. after his sighting, he believes that he said that Bigfoot's, and this is in your book, Bigfoot still lives in Idaho. Bigfoot are beings. They're experts in the wild. They probably know all of the tricks of using shade to their advantage. And he talked about how when he was in the Special Forces, he learned how to. it's possible to hide even under a streetlight in the shadows. And that just totally reminds me of what you talked about there, seeing a Bigfoot in a subdivision. Yep, yep. Well, because who else is out there looking for one, you know? that <clears throat> I honestly think most people would have just looked past what I saw and thought, well, that's a mighty big tree. In fact, that was my first thought was, that's a mighty big tree back there. And they thought, now, hang on a second. You don't have any trees back there. They're still laying out their <laughs> landscape. And here was this Bigfoot, and he was just standing there perfectly still. And there, there he was. <laughs> oh, wow. It's incredible. This um, interview with you, Becky, is really full circle for us because we got our start together doing a Bigfoot panel with Tim. He had written some children's books, and we all kind of got on and asked him Bigfoot questions and sort of flew by the seat of our pants. I knew nothing about Bigfoot and had lots of questions. And so I, I read your I read your story, Bigfoot Lives Forever in Idaho, and I just find you along with the people you interviewed, but you yourself, endlessly fascinating. I mean, you have how many children? Just eight. Yes, <laughs> just eight. Oh, just eight. my. <laughs> I mean, I don't it's, even know. It's all on how you say it. Do it. <laughs> just eight. So, and then you are among one of the tallest women in the world, right? Yep. Yeah, the last and time we are, looked, I was in the top, 100 for the United States and top 200 for the world. But, you know, people wow. are still growing, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And are all uh, of your children tall as well? They're getting there. My, I've got two boys that are 6'8", and then <gasps> my girls range from 6'4 to, I don't know, 5'11", something like that. Wow. Wow. Incredible, incredible. So how did you get your start with your enjoyment and love and fascination with Bigfoot? <laughs> when I was a kid, I grew, I lived on the Fort Hall Choban Indian Reservation. Um, we're not native, but my, my dad was actually born on that property on the reservation so um, dad became a policeman with the Pocatello Police Force, which is the next biggest city to the south. And, but because we lived there on the reservation, he was often called out 
um, as the liaison officer. You know, if they just, if they found something they couldn't handle, they'd call him as he was just right there. And my dad had integrity and so much honesty that people just trust him. That's just the way he is. And hopefully they've gained, I've gained that from him. But he, um, it was when I was about four years old, he was called out to help on this call where this Bigfoot was trained to shake a, a mobile home office foundation. And at the time, a lot of the Indians didn't have, we're talking not even telephones, you know, and, and most of them still cooked on over a fire and, and, you know, talking almost third world country. But anyway, this Bigfoot was trying to shake the house off the foundation and the people waited until the it circled the house and run around the back and they ran out and jumped in the car and went down to the police station and the police sent out two cars with policemen but by the time they got there the the bigfoot was gone but he had completely dismantled the pump house behind the house so they found these great big enormous footprints in the mud and they followed him down the canal towards where we lived and they ran into this Bigfoot that was standing behind a bush, but it was head and shoulders above it was just yelling at them. But the Indians disbelieve if they're not actively hurting anything, you just back off and leave them alone. So they did. They just backed off. And after a little bit, the Bigfoot wandered off and, and left out of that area. And I said, so what happened to the family? Um, and she um, I actually... I actually heard the rest of the story and that was really amazing to me. So, so that happened when I was four years old and, and I started writing my first book in 2012 and I interviewed this lady and she said, so you don't know the rest of the story. And I said, no. Oh. And she said, I said, is there a rest of the story? And she said, yeah. She said that the man who lived in that trailer had taken a pot shot at at a juvenile Bigfoot and drawn blood and didn't huh. kill it. It just kept going. But two days later, here comes this Bigfoot that's just so angry. And I'm like, oh, so this is, this is mama. This is mama saying, leave my kid alone. <laughs> you know? And then I said, so what happened to this family? And she said, that man packed up his whole family and, and left the reservation and moved down to a different reservation because he was afraid that at some point in time, the Bigfoot would come back and cause some more grief and grief and pain. So as it happened, two days after that experience, we drove past that place. And my dad pointed it out to my mom and said, look, see, there's a pump house. And it was just in splinters all over the place. And I remember thinking, well, it's a Bigfoot, you know, because I didn't really know. And um, Liz, I could keep hearing these stories from all over the reservation, all over different places, collecting them because they were fascinating to me because I have big feet. But my feet aren't big like that. <laughs> you know? um, then I found my first a, a big footprints when I was 15, 16, somewhere right in there. Um, my neighbor actually found the prints and then we compared my feet to them and um, it, they were a good four inches longer than my feet are. So from there, it's just been a matter of, wow, this is, this is just amazing that there's beings out there that other people just don't run into apparently. <laughs> anyway. It's wild. Sounds like lots of people do run into them because you've interviewed so many people that have stories. Yeah. And one thing that sort of resounds in all of their stories is if you know, you know. If you've seen one, you know that they yeah. exist. I mean, there's just no yeah. attributing it to anything else. I do have a question about um, the Native Americans. Did they call this creature Bigfoot or was there another term that they would use? So the kind of generic term is Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but every okay. Indian tribe across the United States has a different name. The name that's in our yeah. area, I can't pronounce. 
<laughs> it's like it's like 20 syllables long and it oh, means mm-hmm. um meat eater or man eater one of the two oh. the, um, okay. The reason for that is um, Native Americans, when they name something, it's named because of something that they are seeing. That's part of their culture mm-hmm. is um, when they look at something and they see it, they name it by what they're seeing. And so in our area, they've seen them eat meat. Therefore, they're the meat eaters. But if you go down a little su- southern into the you know southern Idaho, they talk about pine eaters because they've seen them eating pine, pine nuts. A lot. So, uh-huh. because we um, interviewed a couple that owns Board Camp Crystal Mine earlier this year, and they have tons of gems on their property, which is sort of coincides with Idaho being the gem state. But Tim, do you recall what they called? Was it the spirit? I, I, I can't believe remember they, what they called, called Bigfoot. Bigfoot. They're the forest people. The forest yeah. people. That's right. Okay. And yeah. I tell you what, okay. I think I'd rather be out looking for or encountering the forest people or the the vegetarians than the than the, <laughs> the, 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 the menu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be on the menu. I don't want to be on anybody's menu. I could... <laughs> hey, there is a story that uh, I was told secondhand, of course, but. There was an older gentleman that lived here, and he told my one of my relatives that, of course, this was years and years ago. They would travel by wagon to church, and they had a revival one night, and they slipped out the back door to go smoke a cigarette, and they sitting on the, the edge of the wagon, and they said a Bigfoot came out of the woods and went right up to the porch of the church and bent down and put his hands on the porch and just sat and watched the service a little bit of course bigfoot couldn't see them because they were in the darkness and stood back up and just walked off like he was curious as to or he or she was curious as to what was going on in the in the church building so i thought and that was that was told by a gentleman uh you know that was probably that was probably in the 1940s or 30s some somewhere in that time period probably 30s mm. people still had yeah. a lot of wagons around here we country folks around here. Some of those stories here. are just amazing. <clears throat> yeah, you know. What's the closest? And sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, CJ brought up the gym state, Becky, and she brought up Board Camp Crystal Mine. And, of course, they're known for their crystals there, but they suddenly started having Bigfoot activity, and the Native Americans told them about the forest people, but they also told them about the sky people, and they relayed to us about their other paranormal events happening there, UFOs and such as that, mm-hmm. and, and even crystals appearing out of nowhere. But through the course of our show, we've really discovered, quite, you know, not on purpose, but quite inexplicably, uh, a link. It seems like there's some association, or often people are witnessing in close proximity to each other, paranormal things with Bigfoot, you know, uh, UFOs, um, it could be other paranormal things. I couldn't help but notice that Idaho has a lot of ghost towns. It has Mm -hmm. somewhere called Atomic City, where they used to do some (laughs) nuclear things, I think. You've got the Bear Lake Monster, and I I wanted to ask you, do, do you find any association in Idaho between Bigfoot and other paranormal events? So (laughs) when I started collecting these stories, I would hear a lot of other stories and the Indians would kind of branch off and some of them caused me some pretty severe nightmares until I finally just said, you know, let's just stick to the Bigfoot. But, you know, there's things like the, like the water babies or the shapeshifters mm. or, um, you know, they, they have the sky people. And I, one of the Indian gals came to me and asked me, she said, so what is that? And I said, describe what you're seeing. And, and she told me and I said, to me, that sounds like a griffin or a dragon. 
And she, she got all upset. She said, we don't believe in those type of things. And I said, that's funny because if there were not such a thing, why would they have a name? You know, if you that's think right. about it. Right. And, and I think what she's actually seeing is dragon because dragon dragon live here on this earth. They, they don't look like what the fairy tales say they look like. but they, And they're kind of impish and they get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah they're there <laughs> wild wow. so one thing that i was noticing in your stories was um there seemed to be a divide fearful of what they were running into the sounds the smells mm -hmm. wanting to get out of there as quickly as possible and those that had more of a um respect I guess in terms of we're just going to let them be and not interfere and watch from a distance but without any fear of Bigfoot does that seem to be the case with everybody they're either terrified or <laughs> hold them in high regard <laughs> what's interesting to me is there's I run into a lot of people who have not really told their stories to very many others and they'll tell me the story and there really is a lot of fear in, involved in, and I'll listen and I don't know if it's intuition or what, but I kind of, I get a lot of sense or a feeling for what the Bigfoot are trying to accomplish. And like, there was one gal, she was telling me this story and, and she, you know, it kind of got into the fanciful, like, and they were going to eat me, you know? And, and I said, you know, what? I, I really don't think so. Because in all of these hundreds and hundreds of people I've interviewed, no one's gotten eaten. In fact, there's some pretty <laughs> doggone cool stories from way back, like like the turn of the 19th century that, that are fascinating to me. But um, there's an awful lot of people who... Um, oh, here, another, another case in point. Somebody, they spent their life looking for the Bigfoot or just wigged clear out of their brain and uh, and I just thought okay calm down <laughs> <laughs> they are just big beings and and a lot of people are scared because they are so tall but I I get that man I as a tall woman <laughs> there are a lot of people who are really wigged out when they meet me for the first time I always make it a point to sit down as soon as possible because you know, mo the average woman comes up just above my belly button, you know? So, oh, wow. And it's, How tall are you, it's Becky? Kind of six, six. Yeah. Wow. So I've got a, 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 I've got a good, you know, 14 inches on the average woman. And yeah. so I usually sit down to have a conversation because it generally puts them at ease a little bit more. Otherwise, it's, it's this fear factor. Oh, my gosh. There's something big. I don't understand it. It's scary. It happened when it was dark, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they just, they start to overreact. And I just think, okay, take a deep breath and let's break this down. Okay. Yeah. You were out there. You had some food with you or you, you know, <laughs> I, I hear my, the one thing I started doing with my books from the very beginning, a lot of integrity and as much honesty as could possibly be derived from any story. And therefore, I will not take a story when the person is obviously inebriated or otherwise impaired. Mm. Because you, know, you hear those stories and, man, everything's big. Everything's oh, yeah. scary. And you're like, chill, man. <laughs> <laughs> you sure that isn't the beer talking and the whiskey here? <laughs> yeah. So, Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just a question what is your favorite account that someone's given you over the years do you have a favorite uh, story that someone's told you about their encounter with Bigfoot um, it kind of changes as I hear some of the new ones some that just make me laugh you know um, <laughs> I interviewed this guy and you might have read his account in one of the books um he didn't really believe in the Bigfoot. And then one day 
as he was getting ready to go to bed, he glanced over through his window and here was this Bigfoot looking in his fifth wheel, looking at him. And um, it, that scared the crap out of him. So he goes back in the back room and um, calls his friend and he's shaking in his shoes and he's like, there's this thing out there. And the guy says, describe it. So he describes it and he's like, oh, that's a Bigfoot. You should go out and take it something, you know, like take it some peanut butter. And he's like, there is no way on God's green earth you're going to convince me to go out there and give, it a, give him some peanut butter. But <laughs> from that point, <laughs> he is now one of the funniest. It's just been amazing to watch this relationship grow. I went back and in the fourth book, which is just brand new out, it's the um, Bigfoot Lives Any Everywhere in Idaho. What I did is I went back and I re-interviewed a lot of people from those first three books that had ongoing stories with ongoing experiences. And his was one of them. And I went back and I said, you know, how, do, how has your life changed since you've known the Bigfoot? And how, you know, how, and, and his, he's just all cool about it now. You know, it's like, yeah, they're the neighbors, you know, and sometimes they get obnoxious and you kind of have to kick them in the keister and say, settle down. You know? <laughs> um, but the funniest thing with him, I swear this Bigfoot that's following him around is a female and she's got this thing for him because every <laughs> single time he takes a, a lady out on a date, it always ends bad. I mean, it just always ends bad. Oh, he wow. said, um, <laughs> and I, I, it's probably part of this is in the book too, but they went out. Um, he had this gal in this pickup with him and they were out out in the middle of nowhere and they're making out and th things are getting a little hot and heavy. And all of a sudden the back end of his pickup gets picked up and dropped <laughs> three feet to the side. And of course oh, that breaks up God. anything that's happening in the front, you know, and the girl is like, take me home. <laughs> and he's terrified. Like, Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> but it keeps happening. And I, I'm like, you know what? I think you've got a female that's got the sweet for you and, you know, she's just going to keep on pestering you and giving you crap until you acknowledge the fact that she's your, she's your soulmate. And <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, she was sisters. creeping on him through his window to begin with. <laughs> better look out. We could, I guess we could coin the phrase Bigfoot stalker. That would be the good, she's stalking him, I guess. <laughs> what do you do when you get stalked by bigfoot there's no real precedent for being stalked by bigfoot so i know right it's the opposite that's a pretty pretty unique problem there but, uh, that is funny you know becky you said earlier that these people that are you know terrified of bigfoot you always tell them well you haven't heard any stories of people getting eaten by bigfoot but i mean that's because yeah. those people are dead <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they didn't live to tell their story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've been eaten by Bigfoot. I mean, if we're calling him, you know, man eater and meat eater, who knows? You, uh, I'd be you terrified have, too. I'd be yeah, running you don't have hills. to be the fastest person to escape Bigfoot. You just have to not be the slowest. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, though, in all of these stories that I've collected. I tell people that the only stories that I have taught to people where it's ended badly has been when the human has been acting like an idiot, right. you know, where they've mm -hmm. been doing something they shouldn't have been doing. Um, it's like um, one of the stories that happened, they put it on BFRO over in this area and these people were out and they were supposedly having a picnic um, and this, they, this Bigfoot came up and scared the heck out of them. And the, they were, you know, fearful of their lives as they got back in their vehicle and left the area. You know, that sounds pretty straightforward, right? So, but why is the Bigfoot all upset on busting up their picnic, you know? So I was out with a good friend of mine and he's seen the Bigfoot five or six times all in the same area. And we were driving around out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, did you read that excerpt from the, you know, BFRO where it says that that guy got chased down by this Bigfoot? 
And I said, yeah, I read that. And he said, you want to see where it happened? I said, sure. Oh, cool. So we go over and it is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally on the side of this gravel pit area, there's no way to have a decent picnic unless you're, you know, unless you're sitting on the side of the mountain watching your salad go down the, to the cliff. <laughs> yeah. And um, he said, this is exactly where it happened. And this is, you know, because he said he knew the people who reported it. And I'm like, there's no way that they were having a picnic out here. And what the heck were they doing at that time of day? And he said, exactly. He said, now, if you didn't know that there was a Bigfoot involved, what would you think? And I said, well, drug deal, war, you know, they're up to no good. But number one thing came up would be a drug deal going down. Right. He said, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. And he said, and yet they blamed it on the Bigfoot because Bigfoot broke everything up, scared us. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. Good for him. Town police. <laughs> that sounds like a, a new television show to me, Bigfoot P.I. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, I love I that idea, it. actually. Or Bigfoot yeah. Wilderness Protector or something like that. I, well, what's, your, it. what's your opinion on uh, why has not a body uh, obviously been found yet uh, in the in the woods? You know, uh, animals obviously expire at some point in time. Why has not right. a Bigfoot body been found? I've got so my theory. I, I want to hear yours. So there is actually three stories that I can tell you about that. And um, I interviewed this guy who was an old scout leader, Boy Scouts leader. And he said he took his scouts on a 50-mile hike up in the center of Idaho, up in one of those wilderness areas. And he said it was about the middle of the week. So like a Wednesday, they'd hiked roughly 23 miles. And he said they'd set up camp for the night and the boys were playing steal the flag. They're just out fooling around. And he said he and the other leader were sitting by the tents getting supper ready. And the kids came back and were just shaking in their shoes. And they said, we found something. You got to come see it. So they take him over and they, in the middle of this cluster of uh, bushes, they found these five graves that were all laid out one next to the ne next to each other, five of them. And he said, every single one of them were longer than 10 feet long. So wow. he said it, they had been laid out. He would guess like the fall of the following year of the previous year. Sorry. Because yeah. he said there were little, you know, little, little weeds growing back up, but not nothing, nothing big. And um, he said the scouts were paranoid and they were afraid that an axe murderer was carrying bodies up there. And he's like, no, 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 look at this. Look at this. Logically, we've just hiked 23 miles. There's no axe murderer in the world is going to kill somebody and drag a body 23 miles just to bury it in this specific spot. You know, and it's an old grave. We're safe for the night. You're okay. And he said it took a while to get the kids settled down, but, but he remembered that and he told me about it. And I thought, that is stinking cool. That's something I would That's like so to awesome. see. But they didn't take any Not pictures or anything. And then I mean, the I've second... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, I've dug ditches and stuff before, and you wouldn't gra dig a grave as hard as that would be to do four feet longer than necessary, or you know, my two or three feet. That that'd be a lot of digging for just a normal human being. You wouldn't want that that long. Yeah. That's too much work. Uh, it had to be yeah. something, yeah. something else. So one of the other stories I'd ask, because uh, I was asking this question prior to hearing that story, what happens to them when they die? And one of the main stories that I kept hearing over and over again was that uh, they've seen them 
take them down to the river, put their bodies in the water, and stack rocks on their chest until they're carried yeah. down into the water. So I'd heard that one. And then just two months ago, I was interviewing a fella who's 73 this year. He's Native American, grew up here on the reservation, and he's had some really phenomenal experiences with the Bigfoot. And literally, they are his neighbors, and he, and he treats them like neighbors. But he, we have talked about a lot of the stories because they've had four generations worth of interactions with these families. And um, I said, so have you ever heard of one getting killed? And he says, yeah. He said, back when I was young, like um, 12 or 13, some teenagers who were older than I was were fooling around up the mountain. They had been drinking. They were driving too fast. And they came down around a corner and they hit a baby Bigfoot. And of course, it made them all sick. You know, it, it, it was dead. So two of the young men stayed with the Bigfoot. The other two went down into the valley and they got the, the spiritual leaders. The, and they went up and he said they held a funeral for him and they sang and they danced. And they, um, he said it was, they were trying to make amends for the stupid activity that these kids had done, you know, while they were drunk, while they were being idiots. And I said, is that grave still there? And he said, yes, it's still there. It's on par. He said, the grave is still there. It's still protected. And there's still somebody who still put something on that grave because he's seen it. And, and I was thinking, man, that is cool. I had never heard that story before. Yeah. So there's your three different versions. Oh, that is mind-blowing. Okay. Yeah, that's something. That and crazy. plus, I mean, you know, you think about as much, I'm a hunter, and as many times I've been in the woods, I've very rarely found any kind of carcass. I'm talking about any kind uh, of mm. animal bones or anything. I think they just get scavenged so quickly uh, that that. Basically, that's what happens to most things around here. Uh, if it's dead, it's going to be scavenged very quickly. So that could be another possibility I mean, of, of how you know, these things a, disappear. There's a good for this last book. And I actually put, um, let me think, he's in The Bigfoot Lives Forever also. Mm -hmm. His name is Dave Erlinson, and he is a backwoodsman. He's He lives outdoors more than most people live indoors. He's just one of those yeah. fellows that he just feels more comfortable outside. So um, he had this amazing experience this last year. He's run into the Bigfoot before a couple of, the, couple of different times. The first time I interviewed him, he said he had heard him scream in close proximity and it just shook him through his 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 um, torso and then he's like uh i interviewed him on a friday the following wednesday he actually saw a bigfoot jump across the road in front of their pickup as they were coming down the mountain and but that was the only two experiences that he remembered okay so if you've read most of my stuff, I talk about how I believe that people who have had near-death experiences are more in tune with spiritual entities such as the Bigfoot. So he, uh, this is Labor Day weekend last year, 2020. He was up in the mountains on a horse. He said it was a new horse to him and the saddle did not fit him. And he was all alone out hunting. And he said he was a mile up into the woods and the horse, um, he, he was cueing it to go to the north. The horse turns to the south and he went off the horse and he fell on this rock embankment and he broke his neck. Clean break. Oh. Broke his neck. Oh. And he said, I'm laying there thinking I've carried men out of the woods that have been hurt worse than this. And I know that if I stay here, I'm going to die. But I also know if I stand up, there's a good chance I'll never walk again in my life. 
But he said, what choice do you have? I didn't, I'm not ready to die. So he said he stood up and he held on to the horse's um, saddle and he walked about half a mile down the mountain. And by then he was getting pretty weak. So he got on the saddle and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you crazy nut. So he gets on the saddle, comes down another half a mile, loads the horse into his rig and he starts for the nearest hospital. And he was partway to the hospital when he realized that he couldn't, he was starting to not be able to breathe. So he pulled off at this little mom, pa business. And he, he said, by then he's got blood all over his face from the day. And he said, I go in and I made it in there and fell down on my knees. And I said, please, please just call 911. Please just help me. And luckily, there there was an ambulance four minutes away. They got him in. They intubated him. Um, he had to have a whole full halo for the whole eight weeks, I think it was. But he's able to walk now. And um, so I actually went out to visit him when he had the whole halo thingy on. And he said, Becky, it was the dangest thing. I'm laying there in the hospital. My kids are coming to visit me. And he said, I remembered memories that had completely been suppressed about the Bigfoot. And he said, oh. I can tell you that I have run into the Bigfoot and stood less than 20 feet away from them. And he said, in close proximity, my kids were aware of it because of where I'd been in the mountains. You know, I, he said, I'm on game trails that they're all coming down off the mountain. I know where to find the footprints. And anyway, he's telling me all these amazing things. And then, um, he gets the halo off December 6th, 2020. And a week and a half later, they found cancer in his gut. Mm. So oh, right man. in between there, he's had a crazy life. So he said his neighbors came by to stop and visit him. And, and they said, you'll never guess. Um, the kids were driving past your place just to check on it. And they saw this. And he's like, what? <laughs> I mean, he lives way out in the middle. He's the last place before you ro go into the mountains. Yeah. And I think he actually built it, that cabin he lives in. But um, they said, you know, here's this this Bigfoot. Well, he said it just happened that he, uh, he had these trees, these apple trees, and he's all excited to pick the apples for the year because he keeps them... <laughs> He said he went down and there was nothing left on the tree, not anything. And he said normally, <laughs> normally all of those apples would fill the back of a pickup. And he said there's nothing there, but way, 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 way up at the top of the tree. And he was like, "Crap," you know. <laughs> so, un unbeknownst to him, while all this stuff was happening in his life, these two neighbor kids who saw the Bigfoot the first time. They went looking for it every night after their chores were done. They would drive around his place and up and down the roads looking for Bigfoot. And they saw him coming out of the neighbor's orchard. So so I, I said, So so you've got you've got a you've got a Bigfoot that's got a sweet tooth. And he's like, Yep, yep. Well, I talked to him just three days ago, and he said, um, he's he's back to walking like five miles a day. He goes everywhere, but he hadn't been up on top of his ridge. And he said, one of his, man, it looks like the carcass King, you know, where everybody's dropped all their carcasses for the last 20 years. He said, it's there's dead fall and there's, there's all these animal carcass, just big piles of them. And uh, he's like, you know, it's a dang to sing. He said, I kind of wonder now if that Bigfoot is hanging out at the back, you know, just because it's a, huh. you know, pick my place clean, <laughs> oh, <laughs> stay yeah. for the apples. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so, so that was pretty cool, but he, he's yeah. literally run into a lot. <laughs> wow. He sounds That's like so a sick. tough guy. Oh my yeah. goodness. That's an amazing wow. story. We're talking. If you read the, uh, that that book, the the fourth book is it's just coming out. <laughs> I was reading another book while I finished that one, and um, 
a lot of the books you'll read nowadays have recipes in them. And I, I was laughing and just t teasing my husband. And I said, you know, I should put some books. In, I should put some recipes in here. You know, Sasquatch <laughs> stew, or Bigfoot barbecue. And, yeah, and telling, he's laughing. At, he's like, you should do that. So I called Dave and I said, Dave, I'm actually thinking about doing this. And he takes it just serious. He's like, you know, I could share some excellent recipes with you. So if you look in book four, in the very back, there is some excellent recipes on how to cook muskrat, <laughs> how to cook decent moose, <laughs> how to cook any type of chicken you can catch out in the forest, you know, chucker, pheasant or yeah. whatever. And his, his mama's secret for just about everything. And it's a, it's funny. I left a lot of his personality in there because he's just a kick in the pants. <laughs> what a character. He's a like tough that. old bird. I need to check that out. And I see a future episode coming up uh, of All Things Unexplained Bigfoot Tasting Competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that would be terrific. And a little bit of a mix of Fear Factor in there as well i think so we're talking to award-winning bigfoot author becky cook if you'd like to pick up a signed copy of one of her books you can check out our website beckycookonline.com becky we have a couple of great listener questions here if you're up for it go ahead okay so listener george winters long time listener he had a couple of questions he he wants to know does anyone have any guess about the life expectancy for a Bigfoot? And great question, George. See, I don't know how long they live, but I know that they live a lot longer than us because mm -hmm. um, I've interviewed people who've had dealings with some that are up in their hundreds. And he said they're not slowing down. They're in really excellent physical shape. 132 years old was the one, and um, the other one wow. was like 140 something. I don't even remember what. But they don't, they're not laying around eating Cheetos and basking <laughs> on the couch. <laughs> I feel like True. they're living a pretty natural life out there. And, you know, makes, that is. Makes you wonder what, how much longer we'd live. Oh, yeah, I know, right? We need to. Well, uh, Idaho, I discovered, is the Huckleberry State, and of course, lots of potatoes. Oh, yes. So maybe yep. they're just eating lots of potatoes and huckleberries. But you know, Becky, <laughs> I did notice that in a lot of your stories, the witnesses would make additional comments. Like, uh, I think it might have been to, uh, a listener in Basin Patch or perhaps Freeman Lake, but one of your witnesses in your book comment about how the Bigfoot just kind of slinked away like an old man and casually yeah. but but yet casually pushed a tree out of his way going uphill with his left hand. So yep. a superhuman old man. But they noted that right? <laughs> and other right and other witnesses noted well it definitely did not seem like an old Bigfoot. Or yeah. uh and so I just thought that was interesting. Great great question george and i think that you're you're probably right i would suspect that these entities do do are very long lived if i had to guess yeah and he did have another yeah. question here do and I, and i bet you have a good insight into this do people do witnesses think they are seeing the same one over a period of years it depends on who you're talking to I actually had an ongoing relationship with just one for a long time. And I actually miss seeing him. We moved. He did not. He's probably still in the same area. Yeah. Oh, we see. saw additional Bigfoot too, but we saw that one a lot. And it was just, he had a funny sense of humor and just funny, funny Bigfoot. <laughs> So I know that some people have those ongoing relationships and others, I think they're different. You know, like the one, the scout leader who said he found those five graves, he'd run into them and he said the first one was white and gray 
you know, like you'd think an old man, but he said, I think it was just its color. And then um, one of the others he ran into was black and uh, black and brown with brown shimmery um, hair. Right. And, you know, you mentioned, and of course, the the Bigfoot fellow with the uh, female Bigfoot attentive <laughs> that, that was sir george might have missed that that part so what somebody uh in idaho has a a lady uh suitor bigfoot <laughs> yeah but it's interesting you brought up the white bigfoot because one of your encounters in your book in where was it in driggs idaho did i say that right right yeah. driggs so they actually yep. encountered at, at a sheep camp, and I really loved this story. Uh, what they described as a tall, white Bigfoot with a Chewbacca-like head, not not an ape-like head. And now you've mentioned that, that you know you've heard of other white Bigfoot encounters. Mm-hmm. Do you do you hear about that a lot? And do you, do you think it's because of the winters there, and maybe some sort of Yeti connection or confusion or what? <laughs> I ask one of my native friends about that because um, one of the questions I had when I first started was, do they age like we do? Like, do, does their hair turn gray? Do, you know, do they fade at the temples? Mm-hmm. Or, um, <laughs> you know, is this something that that defines them as being older? And she said no. She said she had actually seen newborn Bigfoot that had a cream or a gray hair texture to them. I said, so what about the other thing? A lot of the stories that I've collected are have to do with male Bigfoot. And I had kind of formulated this opinion, you know, like, so obviously there's female ones because that's how you get the baby ones. So are they more protective of the females or, you know, why is it that you just don't see them or hear of them so much? And she said that they're more, um, she said it seemed like females were more content to just stay closer to their homes and take care of their kids. But um, I said, okay, so do they, do the females grow their hair long like some women do? And she said she had seen them where they, they grew their hair long and they would tuck their hair back behind their ears and tuck a flower behind their ear. And she oh. said like, so, mm-hmm. um, we got talking about um, the, the smell. Cause I noticed that um, there are times when there's a distinct smell and there's others when there's not. And then each different Bigfoot has a different smell. And she mentioned that also. She said that they use their smell like a calling card. So they can be coming past your place. You may not even be able to see them, but you'll smell them. And it will literally only be there for 10 or 15 seconds. You know, that's what you'll know. It's not, it's not a skunk because skunks has a real oily smell. Oh. Everything. <laughs> so, but a Bigfoot smell will be there and then it'll be gone. And, and I've noticed that quite a bit. So it's, it's, it's been fascinating. As I, there are so many older natives that have had these relationships. And it's fascinating to me. And as I find these people, I am just so happy to just sit down and just say, please just tell me some stories. Tell me your experience. And then sit and just listen and ask some questions about you know, what do they look like? And one thing that amazed me was that they speak more languages than we realize. I mean, people will say, oh, they're just a stupid animal. And I think, no, no, a lot of them are smarter than me, you know, and they're um, just right here close. I've had stories where they've spoken to them in Navajo, in Shoshone, in the Bannock, in English, and then also in a like a um, some type of a fragmented German conversation, but the Bigfoot also have their own language as well. It's so uh, it's just there are so many things that most people have no concept of because 
it's not something they look that deep into, you know? Right. And that's it where one of your sounds stories... like a lot of... Go ahead, Tim. Sorry, CJ. I was going to say, Becky, we're, we're talking with award-winning Bigfoot Arthur Becky Cook. Check out Becky Cook online to pick up a signed copy of any of her books. But one of the things that, the stories that struck me, Becky, and I was just like, wait, what? Is a witness that you interviewed in that had an encounter in Freeman Lake. And mm -hmm. she said that she had heard some whoops from the Bigfoots, but not like the whoops you hear on television. And we all know about finding Bigfoot and, you know, those folks going out and whooping in the woods. And I've got my own <laughs> whoop, and my son, my son has his own whoop, and my daughter has her own distinctive whoop. But this is what caught me off guard. I was like, wait, I've never heard this before. She said she also heard beeps from the Bigfoots and and heard different beeps coming from at least three different side. And now you're mentioning yeah. the different languages and that kind of makes sense, right? And I've never really heard about these other sounds that Bigfoots are making. They, they're they really curious beings and they listen and they mimic really well. So, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen the Harry and the Hendersons Oh, yeah. movie mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. he he echoes yeah. that siren that has happened and, and like um where they'll echo the sound of a baby crying just mm -hmm. up close um there's been some really amazing things just 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 the and i don't know whether they're just playing with us or what but um it, it's fascinating to me you know <laughs> There's oh, yeah. more intelligence there than just a plain old, you know, cat. Well, cats are pretty smart too, but. <laughs> <laughs> and evil. And so, evil. <laughs> um, the Bigfoot screams seems to be prevalent. There were a lot of stories about people hearing Bigfoot screaming and just how like gut shaking those screams are yeah. where do we think that i mean why do we think that exists is that just some sort of defense mechanism or a way to communicate why what is everybody's thought on why the bigfoot are screaming at them you know i haven't really thought to ask that type of question but i know that um i know that i have a deep voice for a woman and I know that they have even deeper voices because of longer vocal cords. So if you hear one yell at you, you'll hear it, man. And you'll feel it through your whole body shaking. It, you know, it's just, blah, 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 you know, like you're standing next to like a big diesel engine. You can feel that vibration. <laughs> it's kind of like that. And that's why when somebody says, well, I, you know, this thing happened and I don't know whether to believe it was a Bigfoot or not. If you can feel it through your chest, it's probably pretty much a Bigfoot. I don't know why they do it, though. I, sometimes I think it's a warning. Just, you know, back off. Um, you're doing mm -hmm. something stupid. Back off. <laughs> yeah. I well, don't know. It was surprising to me. It was surprising to me to hear how many people had experienced the screams because I'm a novice when it comes to Bigfoot. But you know, from what I understood, they keep to themselves. They don't really want to interact with people too much. They're sort of hidden in the forest. So to hear that they were making themselves very, very known vocally. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's been, um, when I when I interview these people, there's a lot of stories that I don't use in my books because um, either the people don't want to go on record or there's no way of verification that it happened or something just doesn't sit right. And, and I mean, there's somebody asked me, he said, how can you tell when somebody's telling the truth? And I said, it's a gut level reaction. You know, there are times when somebody will tell me a story and halfway through it'll change. And I'll just think that's where you started to lie you know, to make it sound better. Yeah. Um, there was one story this fellow told me, and I just thought, that is so, is 
a couple of people in the in the group had written about it. But this guy was saying that um, there were seven of them had gone up to go hunting elk in the middle of winter. And he said, we're watching this herd of elk come over the hill. We're waiting for the buck. Everybody's hunkered down on their stomachs and most of them have their scopes out scoping this, this herd of elk. And over the rise, here comes this big bull elk. And he said, it comes down over the hill, maybe 20 feet or so. All of a sudden it puts down its horns and just runs right into the back of this big boulder. And then this black thing comes sailing through the air and lands in the snow. And he said, we watched this enormous fight play out while this elk took on this Bigfoot and they went back Holy and forth cow. and back and forth and they were screaming and they were yelling. He said, sounds coming out of that elk I've never heard before. And there wow. came a point in that, in that whole fight where the Bigfoot grabbed hold of the elk with his left hand, his grabbed his horns with the left hand and he just reached over with his right arm and he disemboweled the elk from Holy butt God. end to, to the front, just laid it out. And, you know, everything stops. And he ripped off the hindquarters off of that elk, put it over his shoulder and went up off the mountain. And this guy says, we're all sitting there and it's almost like a breathless anticipation of you're, you're seeing this whole thing play out in front of you and such majesty and such strength and, you know, just amazing. Wow. And, and I said, so what'd you do? And he said, well, we gave him a couple of minutes to get ahead of us, but we went up to harvest the rest of the carcass because they weren't going to let it just waste. And he said, I said, so that must have been pretty cool he said yeah he said one of the biggest elks i've ever seen but he said what really got me was that there were bite marks all over its neck that looked human you know and so as they're fighting the thing is just biting the heck out of his neck and i thought man that would be something else <laughs> wow. so yeah. There's that some pretty is, cool stories out there. <laughs> yeah, that's something you don't hear every day. Holy cow. No. That's I will say one thing that I love about your book, and I, I read one and Tim read a different one. I think um, I'm going to have to read all of the other ones too, but the stories are really short and they're really yeah. simple. And people's stories aren't overly extravagant it's just you know straightforward here's what i saw or heard or smelled or felt or what have you it almost felt to me like all these people were sitting around a campfire with you and they were all just kind of sharing their <laughs> stories and then i got to enjoy them and read them on my end and um from really really simple to some were a little bit more extraordinary but they um all just felt very real and very like it could be anybody's experience if they open their eyes and their mind to it. And it's a very quick read. I would highly recommend anybody go out there and, you know, pick up the book and it's very well priced. I got the Kindle version. It was not expensive at all. And so I just was able to enjoy it over the past few days and um, can't wait to read the others, but you have some children's books too. Yes. Yeah. I (laughs) started working on these children's books last year and I've been writing for my kids for years and years and years. <laughs> so <laughs> my kids have kind of have been the instigating factor behind the fact that they wanted me to tell the Bigfoot stories. I mean, seriously, my little brother, when I first said that I would write the Bigfoot book, the first one, he just thought that was cool because he used to drag me out to these Boy Scout things. And he's like, well, Becky's had a Bigfoot encounter. <laughs> tell him about it. You know? <laughs> and, and I tell these stories. And um, it was kind of that way with the children's books, too. The kids kept saying, Mom, you've got all these really cool stories in there. We'd love to have you you know, get them all ready for your grandkids. And my problem is I ha- I, I can create stories like crazy, you know, the, the fictional ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great problem to have. So, Becky, yeah, we have a friend of the show that has chimed in on Facebook, Dane Beck, and he's actually from Montana. 
and he's cool. passed along a lot of just incredible UFO stories and Bigfoot stories to me from his experiences in Montana and elsewhere. And he said, you know, we were talking about Harry and the Hendersons. So a friend of the show, Dane Beck, said he loves Harry and the Hendersons. He's watched it probably a thousand times. Love it. And get this, John Lithgow, we know the main main character, the dad mm-hmm. in Harry and the Hendersons, actually hit on his mom once, and that was on Wild Horse <laughs> Island, Flathead Lake, Montana. <laughs> wow. <laughs> A listener uh, personal experience there with Harry and the Hendersons. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That is funny. Uh, let me ask you a question. What What's your thoughts on the Patterson-Gimlin film? You know, I know Robert Gimlin and I just love him. He's just... That's amazing. Stinking cool. He's it he's one of the most genuinely nice people you'll ever meet, and I think he's what eighty seven this year, eighty six. You know, people say, I have I've heard people say, yeah, that thing is such a crock. And I said, have you heard him speak? He'll tell you the story, and it happened way out, thirty three miles off the main road. You know, and and. and People say, "Yeah, it was somebody in a in a where he was headed to go out and get dressed to get everything all lined up." But then you got to hear the rest of the story because when they started to come back from that, from when they saw the female Sasquatch, as they started to come back, it nearly killed them. They not the Bigfoot, but their experience coming yeah. back. It was raining like crazy, and he said they had an old, old pickup, old horse trailer loaded with horses. They ended this mountain, and he said it was so incredibly treacherous. And he, you know, he can relate that to you, and you can hear the hear the fear in the in his voice. People don't make those things up, you know. And when he talks about the Bigfoot, it's incredible. It's just, he hasn't had an experience since then, but his is like the grandfather, the the grandfather of one that people go back and look at because it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, I've also, um, the one guy who did the, uh, the Bigfoot costumes for Hollywood he was in my car once and oh, <laughs> I was giving him a ride Did he somewhere. Hit on you? And we... <laughs> you better be careful well, being seen with that guy. The time. <laughs> he was telling me some of the stories about, you know, about how the, the Bigfoot costumes are made. And of course, I've seen, you know, I've seen him, you know, Six Million Dollar Man. I've seen that version because my son had a fixation on that one and we watched Classic it over and version. over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yep it wasn't somebody in a in a suit you know and i i've seen yeah. dr jeff meldrum take that apart and watch the way she walks and and you can't make this up i mean you could but it would sure take an awful lot of ridiculous amount of energy and and then what would you get <laughs> something that somebody else would fight for the rest of their life to say well that weren't real <laughs> oh yeah you know you you brought up two great points there, Becky. Number one, if you look at the other costumes that Hollywood was putting out at the time, right now you look at them, you say, okay, that's fake. That's a dude in a suit. It's obvious, right? Yep. But even to this day, you cannot look at the Patterson-Gimlin film and say that definitively. You just yeah. can't say it. Not only that, but the Patterson-Gimlin film, Bigfoot, is a female and you have to yep. ask yourself yeah. if they were going to fake that, why, why, why would they choose a female Bigfoot? That that makes no sense. It would have to exponentially add to the difficulty of the task. Yep. Yep. And Smitty, I'm glad you brought up the Patterson Gimlin film because Becky, I noticed 
on Bigfoot Still Lives in Idaho, the cover of your book, which was fantastic, was done by Brandon Tennant, or Tennant, Tennant, I think, who was raised in West Yellowstone, it said, and the, the drawing for the cover was originally titled Patty Lives, so I was mm-hmm. actually talking to CJ, you know, about who Patty is, and so it's a very <laughs> close likeness uh, of Patty as well, uh, you know, based on the Patterson-Gimlin film as well as descriptions of the Idaho Bigfoot. Yep. Yep. Brandon's pretty amazing. He takes, he'll sit down like a police artist and he'll ask people questions, you know, well, how do you taint? He'll change out the nose and the eyes. And he asked me a couple of times, you know, what would you change about this picture? And I say, you know, Brandon, they all look different. (laughs) They're all individual. (laughs) So you might see something that's entirely different than me. (laughs) Oh yeah. So something interesting from our friend of the show, Dane Beck, he said he actually grew up on the Indian reservation, the largest in the 48, the Blackfeet Indian reservation. I had no idea about our friend Dane. Uh, I had no idea about that about him. And in their folklore, he said they have something called Goat Man. Yeah. That is probably pretty similar. And we had a question from George Winters again, if, if you're up for another question, Becky. He heard you sure. talking about Native American interaction with Bigfoot. He want to know is Native American culture, in their culture, is Bigfoot seen with skepticism, or is he just accepted like any other animal? He's accepted just like anything else. In fact, um, when I wrote the first book, I did this Bigfoot convention, and um, I went up and spoke with the elders of the of the tribe, and elders in this tribe can be male or female. So there's about equal amount, male and female. So I'm chatting with this elderly lady and um, she said, why would you see a Bigfoot? He said, don't make no sense. Some white Bigfoot. She said, we see him all the time. We turn our heads, you know, we don't want to make eye contact. And I thought that's, that's the issue right there. You know, cause They've lost a whole generation of people who used to do, you know, the herbal herbal concoctions that kept everyone healthy and happy. And, you know, and, and they've lost this whole generation of people who used to talk to the Bigfoot. I, I, some of the older stories that I've gotten from old folks on this, on this Indian reservation are about when they used to have foot races with the Bigfoot. And they would they would race them, oh. and and uh, <laughs> the one that was told me they said that they they would all line up, and the Bigfoot would give the humans a good long distance head start, and then at some point they would just take off, and the Bigfoot would just flash right past them, because obviously <laughs> they can run. <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> but this sounds like me racing the, you, Mal. <laughs> I doubt it. We'll race live on the show next time. <laughs> we have to. Loser but leaves you, town, right? I, yeah, I have, for sure, loser leaves town. I couldn't help but picture in my head a a record breaking show of for viewers Usain Bolt versus the Bigfoot. Yeah, that would yeah, be good. Be- Tim, you have so many great TV show ideas for the Bigfoot. <laughs> we gotta get All of your future uh, children's books here, have though. been written tonight. <laughs> um, it actually makes me think of one of the pictures in your book. So there's a picture. Of, it's in the snow, and there's three footprints. And you had said that they were each about... I can't remember now, but they were very far apart from one another. And you don't see any other footprints on either side. And so it's very, very convincing that this is Bigfoot walking through the snow. Who took that picture? Do you recall? So it was given to me by one of the guys who actually found that. Um, I think it was, it might have been Chuck Rogers. I know when I did this last book, he actually did several drawings and drew what he saw. 
you know, and the, the patterns that were in the snow and then how the road laid when he saw the Bigfoot in the moonlight. That was really mm -hmm. fascinating. Another yeah, that guy picture's just great. That I love picture that. That. So, yeah. <laughs> I had actually seen something in Colorado in um, November. And Tim, do you remember when I sent you that picture? And I never, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know why I just like kind of let it go. <laughs> I was hiking in Colorado after it had snowed. And there were just these giant prints in the snow. And you know, instantly I took pictures of them and sent them to Tim. I was like, look at, look at what I'm seeing. And you had told me. them and I'll send them to you, Becky, and you can tell me your thoughts. But I couldn't tell if it was a foot or if it was a snowshoe or what have you, but they were huge and they were very far spaced out. And um, yeah, I, I know nothing about snowshoeing, so I wasn't sure if maybe that's what I was seeing, but it was fun. Uh, snowshoeing anyway. leaves a pretty definite track though, and you can't really run well with snowshoes. I mean, it's good shuffle. <laughs> Yes. One, yeah. One thing I was wanting to ask you about, Becky, is I noticed in your stories that a lot of the encounters, the folks did have this smelly, you know, horrible smelling experience. And you brought that up too. And a lot of them kind of describe very similar creatures. It made, it brought to mind the skunk ape of florida i was talking to cj about the skunk ape she wasn't familiar with it and of course a lot of different regions in the country seem to have their own particular creature like the skunk ape or the the arkansas bigfoot the the creature of uh boggy swamp for example and the folk lake monster it in your experience you know, can is there a description that you can kind of give of what the general Idahoan Bigfoot looks like or, you know, his characteristics? <laughs> um, the one that I used to see a lot of, he was... I was I'm going to have to think about this. I'm not sure how tall he was. Most people guess around eight or nine feet. And unless you have something to measure against, you don't really know. I know that his foot, his feet, feet were 16 and a half inches long and that he had a pretty impressive stride because we found those footprints all over the place in the yard, <laughs> down the road, in the snow. <laughs> um, but far as face, it just, I've never been scared by any of them. You know, there was one, wow. um, one of them that looked a lot different than the others, and he, but he was massive. He was huge. And people say, well, how big? And I, I said, another thing, you know, I don't have anything to compare him against. But we were standing about 25 feet away, and all I could see was two thirds of his chest, and then down to where his elbow was and just his head and just knowing that I'm standing 25 feet away and that's what I'm seeing. I can tell you that he was huge, just huge. Um, and some of them will have hair up to almost to their eyes and some will have hair that just looked like a guy who hasn't shaved for three or four days. And that just depends. Yeah. It just depends who you're seeing. And um, one of the Indian native fellas, he said that, um, the more eat, the more meat that they eat, the more uh, violent they tend to be. And I don't know, I don't oh. know about that. This is just what he told me that in his experience, they stay away from the ones that whose eyes tend to glow red because they tend to be of a more violent nature. Oh, but he said there's a lot of them that'll have brown eyes and like deep yellow eyes. And he said they're just regular old folk, you know, not scary at all. Wow. You know, it makes sense too that the Bigfoots that are predators would t would probably have to have a higher proclivity towards aggressive behavior and the ability to take something down. That that kind of makes sense. Yeah. 
That's fascinating. I'll One of the stories that my husband. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go go ahead, Becky. No, one of my husband's favorite stories that I tell. Um, this is one that is not in any of the books because the guy who told me it wouldn't tell me the family that it happened to. He wanted to protect them. And since then, he's passed away, so I'm not sure. But I knew where, where it happened. So, like I was telling you, a lot of the natives grew up here on this reservation and they heated with wood and they cooked over wood stoves. And so um, in this particular family, the grandpa of the family would often go in and get wood for his family to use. And he'd use a wagon and horses. So it just happened that he started coming out of the woods, bringing these huge, huge logs that there was no way an old, old fella could get into the wagon and, and get him home. And his kids started saying dad how are you getting these things in the wagon and they kept pestering him and finally he said i have this friend he's very strong he likes coffee (laughs) and they're like oh yeah dad's losing it which is why he didn't tell him in the first place right so the next time he goes up in the woods they followed him on foot and they said he gets up in these woods and he sets up his camp and and hitches the horses and he builds this great big fire. And they said this big Bigfoot came down and squatted and he gave him this huge cup of coffee. And they <laughs> sat there and they chatted like old friends. That's and then amazing. he said the that's and I and so my husband's like, that is just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah. It is. It is. There was one other one that I just, I love this story because um, it's one of those family, one of the families that has like a four generation record of living with the Bigfoot. And I wish to heck I'd known this little old lady because she lived only four miles away from where I grew up. And I didn't hear this story until after she had passed away. But the the granddaughter had had numerous experiences seeing the big. She said normally she saw it when she was being naughty and she was doing things she wasn't supposed to do, like stealing <laughs> cigarettes, smoking them up in the in the in the fort. And then she said one day I was playing hooky and we found this house way out in the middle of nowhere that had been put together by someone who was incredibly tall and strong. And um, she said it was just amazing. And and um, she said, and then I remembered all these stories that my grandma had told me from the time I was just a little kid. And she said, you know, I'm just a stupid kid. I wish I could go back and listen to the stories that my grandma told me. And I said, what'd she tell you? And I said, well, she said, you know, as the people in the tribe got more financially stable, they would build bigger houses and the, her grandma lived in just this little dugout of a of a cabin type place where the toilet was 40 feet down the road in the back. Of... House, you know, brick and the whole works. And she wouldn't live in it. She would stay in her little cabin. And so she would need wood and, and, uh, and the family would go get her this wood. And she said, so we went out into the woods and we brought back this load of wood for grandma and we just dumped it in the middle of the driveway on a Saturday and said, no, just leave it alone, grandma. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll stack it. And they came back the next day and the entire thing had been stacked, just sweet as can be. And she said, grandma, we told you not to do, you know, you're not supposed to touch this. And she said, I didn't. My friends did. And they're like, your friends, you know. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, he's Bigfoot. But she said that these Bigfoot would show up and they took good care of her grandma. They had been good friends for a long time. And she said during the middle of the winter when the snow was really deep, they would come and they would break a path from the back door to her outhouse. And she said, there was just one time, she said, I swear, it was a trick of the sun. But then she said, knowing what my grandma knew, 
I don't think so. But she said they came, she came to visit and her grandma was sitting in this rocking chair behind the one house and seated beside her was another Bigfoot in another chair. Oh, and wow. she said, as she got up, her, she said, my grandma died when she was 94 and she had a bad hip. And this Bigfoot got up and it looked like she had a bad hip, you know, because she just kind of stumbled and, and um, kind of drug that leg a little bit. And she said, she said, I didn't remember that until I was quite a bit older when I started seeing the Bigfoot a lot of my own. But she said, now I wish I'd gone back and I could listen to my grandma and say, Grandma, tell me these stories. When did you first meet him? You know? Stories like that, I just think, you know, it bothers me when people say, well, they're just stupid beings. And I think, no, no, they're different from you and I, but they're not stupid. A lot more to mm -hmm. them than you give them credit for. You just, you just don't see the whole picture. Right. So anyway, what maybe I'm the story. weird one. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I do think we all wish we could go back and listen to our grandparents a little bit more <laughs> and learn a little bit more from our grandparents would be a good thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, both those stories you just told me reminded me of another encounter you described in Bigfoot Lives Forever in Idaho. And we're talking to Becky Cook, award-winning Bigfoot author, Becky Cook online. But this was in Basin Patch. In 1999, mm -hmm. so quite a while back, and Dale Graham, this, yep, that's right, Dale Graham. And this was just a fascinating encounter to me, because he talked about finding hundreds of footprints, 16, 17 inches long, plus smaller ones. So kind of, yep, you know, making you think there must have been juveniles or teenagers or at least younger ones or different size ones at the minimum. And mm -hmm. and Dale Graham was loading, and you included a picture in your book, which was just yep. an incredible picture, just mind blowing. Like, whoa, this this is definitely the footprint of a very large bipedal creature, right? It's hard to look at it and say anything else. May you know, sure, maybe it's a giant human, but this is this is just mind blowing. <laughs> Right, I it's tell a, people it's about job. that, though, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal has size 22 feet <laughs> shoes, and you don't see that man run around barefoot. Nope. <laughs> no, right. I, you know, we, you Basically not, him, probably been, in the woods, you know. Yeah, in the middle of Idaho lately. I mean, come on. Yeah. But, you know, you look at the footprint, like a giant bipedal creature made this. It's just the only thing that comes to your, to your logical mind. And... But Dale was loading wood into a truck and involved all, he suspected it seemed like it involved all this wood knocking, right? So both these stories you just told me involving people carry wood, it does make you wonder, hey, you know, just like we've seen on television and heard lots of stories of, do, you know, does wood knocking play a part in their communication? Does it, does it carry any meaning, do you think? I know when I very first went... Um... <laughs> And wanted to make connections with them. I did a little bit of knocking, but to me, it seemed, I don't know, just looking at it, I felt really kind of juvenile even <laughs> doing that. <laughs> you know, like, I'm out here. Yeah, this is me. Just knocking on the back door. Hello, <laughs> anybody out there? I feel so silly. <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't know what that means. And uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, I told a friend once, I said, you know, in an, in an ideal world, I would love to write their history. You know, someday if we made connections with them and actually got to know them, I would love to write a history and, and what they did and, and how they did things and why did they do certain things, you know? One of the Indian gals I talked to, she said, once they get to know you, it's as though they put a spiritual marker on your head and they recognize you no matter where you are. And I think that's happened with me a couple of times where um, 
I'd been somewhere where I didn't suspect I'd ever run into a Bigfoot and yet, you know, something would happen and I'd just think, no, wait a minute. That was a Bigfoot. No. So, anyway. <laughs> it seems like those that have the experience, are respectful of the experience, are open to understanding, tend to have more experiences, whether that's because whatever they're interacting with understands that they respect them or who knows. But um, for those of our listeners that you know are hopeful to have their own experience, it seemed to me there were some themes in the book in terms of leaving gifts of food. There was a lot of music, drums that were being played. What have you discovered in all of your research that they wanted to visit Idaho and, you know, search for the Bigfoot. What should they be doing? <laughs> There's, uh, I can't even remember, but I did include the story of how I first started um, talking with the Bigfoot. Um, as I've gotten to know more and more places, I've just paid attention and you, I could tell you where they cross different areas in fact, my, the guy I interviewed, Dale, Dale Erlinson, he said the same thing. He said, there's certain places where you always find footprints. There's just, you just always find them. Anyway, when I first started actively seeking a relationship with this Bigfoot, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I am Christian. And I believe that God created everything here on this earth. So... Because th that is the way I believe, I figured I would ask my Heavenly Father, how would I get in touch with these Bigfoot? You know, if they're, if they're actually out there, how do I get hold of them? And the thought came to my mind to just go out and do some, do some, some apples. And it was like March. You, don't, you can't find apples really well outside in March in, in Idaho. So... I took some apples out. Actually, I took some apples and some carrots. We have to tell the horse, whole story here. <laughs> I took some apples and carrots. Knocked on the wood, you know, once, twice, three times, something like that. And then I just enjoyed being out there. I was out in the most beautiful area. And I just love it. I And um, when I'm outside, I sing. And I, you know, just, I'm, I was just enjoying being out there. And I had these apples and I laid them on this fence in a distinctive pattern, um, bigger to smaller, you know, kind right. of random laid out. And then I put the carrots up on top of the fence because they, they weren't going to stay anywhere else. <laughs> so I came back, oh, seven or eight days later, and um, some of the apples were completely gone. Some of the apples were still there, but had been moved around. And then one or two of them had bites taken out of them, big bites, you know. And, and this is, it's in, it's out far enough that there might have been some humans out there, but not, not likely, really. So, um, so I took a few more apples and I set them up in another pattern, left the carrots, which were looking really pathetic by then. And I came back after another week or so, and um, some more of the apples are gone, and some more of them have been eaten. And those carrots looked so fetch and pathetic. I mean, just puckered <laughs> up, pathetic. So I just winged them over the fence and basically just threw them away. And then I brought a few more apples and set them out. And, and this, the third time I was there, I found this apple that was just huge, just huge piece of, just a huge apple. And I set this, set them all up on the fence and I came back after about eight days and um, most of the apples were gone by then. And here's this big apple. It had one bite taken at just one and it had taken more than half of the apple, just one bite. And I thought, okay, that's, that's stinking dang cool. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Some time went by, and I had a, a friend out there with me who's Native American. She's Cherokee talk, Choctaw. She's out there with me, and um, all together there were seven of us humans. And we actually ran. We actually saw some Bigfoot 
um, that trip out, we, we ran into three Bigfoot. One was the great big one that I told you about, and two were, were some like juvenile ones. Um, but I showed this, this friend of mine where I had laid these apples out. And uh, I told her, I said, one of these days I'm going to bring out some melons because the Bigfoot really like melons. She grows the melons in her garden and then she'll, she'll trade the Bigfoot for various things. But she suggested I put some melon out. And, and you know, melons aren't cheap, especially in Idaho during the middle of winter. So I, it was some time later when I found this melon that was probably a little worse for wear. <laughs> but I took it out in the same area where I'd had the, the apples. And there, there's this, it was an old um, homestead area where they had these old trees all in a row. And some of them, the branches had fallen out. And this particular tree, there was this nut hole, like a squirrel would put nuts in. But it was way up in the tree. So here I am, 6'6". Six, six. If I'm, I stood with my belly against the tree on my tippy toes with my arms extended. So I'm, I'm just barely touching maybe eight feet. And I rolled that melon into the hole. And I stepped back and I looked, I looked so stupid. Eyeball. It was a honeydew melon. Looked like a green eyeball sticking out of this tree. <laughs> <laughs> so I just left it, you know, and I think I took a picture of it, but I, I've not, I've not seen it since, so it probably didn't happen. Anyway, um, I came back after seven or eight days and the melon's gone and there is nothing left. And, and so my, my logic on this was thinking, okay, if there was a squirrel or if there were birds or something, you'd find rind, you'd find right. something left over, but there was nothing left over there. And at the bottom of this tree in the dust were these gigantic footprints. And I did not take my cell phone with me. I was just out to be out, you know, and. Um, I didn't have anything to measure with or anything, but, but my own feet. And these were so much bigger than my feet and a lot wider. So I'm, a, I'm thinking that they were from a male Bigfoot and possibly the big one that we'd seen up in the mountains, but huge footprints. And I remember stepping back from that and having such a feeling of awe and thinking, holy cow, look at these prints. Man, I'm. I hope they enjoyed the melon. <laughs> that still just makes me giggle. <laughs> but um, you know, I guess in a perfect world, I probably could have gone all the way back home and got a phone, got my phone, or got a camera or something, and came back and taken pictures. But it was enough for me to see it and to experience it. That was just really yeah. cool. So there you go, folks. Spring honeydew with you. <laughs> Head to Idaho and take honeydew. <laughs> I'm going to take some apples and honeydew to the Uvori here in North Carolina and, and Zagnut, of course. So if, if you ever if you ever heard of Zagnuts and, and uh -uh. Bigfoot's Becky? Uh -uh. So there, what is that? A, well, Zagnut is a candy bar. I, I used to keep a stash up here with me. I had to I had to order them on Amazon because they're really hard to find now. So they're basically like pe a peanut butter candy bar with coconut and a dark chocolate covering. They're delicious. But there's a Bigfoot researcher here in the Uwari National Forest, and he's he, you may have seen him on television before. He's got some famous thermal imagery of a Bigfoot in the Uwari reaching for a Zagnut bar on a stump that he's left out for him at night, right? So he leaves the <laughs> Zagnuts out for Bigfoot. So I'm definitely going to try honeydew, apples, and Zagnuts. I think that's a winning combination. <laughs> I think you'd get smitty with that. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Put a few muscadines out. That'd be good, too. Yep. Yep, I don't know what muscadines are. <laughs> I, I like wine. a Snickers bar better than Zagnut, huh? A wine, I like I think a we Snickers can bar out. better. No, not for me. Maybe for Bigfoot, but not for me. 
Well, Becky, it has been just such a joy having you on with us. And I thank you for sharing all of your stories. And for those that are interested and they should be, they can check you out at um, beckycookonline.com. Lots of books and different things there. Do you have any speaking engagements or anything else coming up soon that we can follow? Oh, there's a couple of... um conventions that are going to happen one over here in idaho and then one down in utah but i don't have all of the specifics yet um we did one online convention last fall that was really fun and and people are like you should do another one of those and i just say nah i'd rather be out with the people and listen to people yeah. and you know <laughs> and are you on social media where people could follow you and get those details um, on bigfootlives.com, uh, I, we have a section in there for, for the calendar that I don't think has been updated. My, uh, my mm-hmm. web gal got in an accident a little bit ago, so she's behind and that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, but on Facebook, we're bigfootlives.com or bigfootlives on Facebook and then bigfootlives.com. Um, and I try to frequently when I know what they're what's going to happen so we've had quite a few of um I've been on quite a few podcasts and radio shows and that's been a lot of fun and I try to put the links up there so I know from what my web gal said they won't all go up but (laughs) some of them will (laughs) nice so we'll certainly link all of your stuff to our page and uh, Smitty Tim you guys have any further questions before we let Becky get back to life. (laughs) You really are a gem. I've never enjoyed talking about Bigfoot as much as I have tonight. So you've had some really good stories and enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming on with us, Becky. I just want to tell you that one of my favorite quotes from you in your book was something like this, Bigfoot, are not human beings. They are their own type of beings, and they cannot be credited with human reactions. Some of their reactions are similar to ours, but but mostly not. Bigfoots are unique and have their own way of life, and I think those are wise words for all of our yep. listeners to remember when they're out there in the woods and to be respectful of the land and of the Bigfoots. And I think that that will serve everyone really well out there. Thank you so much for joining us, Becky. It was amazing. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out to me. Absolutely. CJ, we'll we wish you the best. Again. Say that again. Oh, I said it. We hope we hope that we can have you on again sometime. That'll be fun. That would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Have a great night. All right. So thank you to you all too. of our listeners and people that chimed in as well. You can find us at all things dash to unexplained dot com to find more of our podcasts, past, present. That's right. Make sure to give us a rate. And a follow. We would love to hear from you. CJ Smitty, that was an enjoyable talk. Yes, Wonderful. it was. Uh, she was. He was great. I really enjoyed talking to her. She's and a I lot better than my talking to pictures from Colorado. Well, she's yeah. absolutely better than talking to me. And she's uh, such a great storyteller. <laughs> I mean, and holy cow, so many. Yeah. She just knew so many stories. Off the top of the and just a sweet, seemed like a sweet person, just a nice, genuinely nice human being, too. So, you know, she just really seemed to care about what she's trying to accomplish. Oh, yeah, that definitely came across in her stories, and to me, just put them on the next level of believability, you know. Yep, like she's definitely no, you know, just not some hugster out there trying to peddle something. 
you know, but she's no, um, she didn't even promote her anything once. <laughs> I know. I mean, she's just she's just, just down to very down to earth person. and genuine. Yes. Yeah, just really sweet person. I enjoyed all, that very much. I enjoyed it. Smitty, you want to take us out of here? Yeah, uh, just subscribe to our channel and follow us on Twitter and Facebook and our own webpage. Be f- I just messed up. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, check out our website. Listen to all things unexplained. Be happy, be strange, be unexplained. Thank you. See y'all. See ya.